57talk.com. Gary Cubetta back, Scottsdale, Arizona. It is a Thursday night. It's April now, Larry. Hey, we know what's going on. We're up to date. We're ready to rock and roll. April 2010, and the last edition of Booking Sheet, St. Louis, first half, 1982. I got a lot of email, Larry, because, you know, that really hit a, a nerve with people because the world of professional wrestling starting to come undone, you know, the old school, and uh, it, the new school is, is beginning uh, 82, 83, 84. Yeah, this is a transformational period. And we should mention it's not actually the last episode of St. Louis Wrestling Booking Sheets because we'll cycle around, and I think you want to talk, first of all, after we finish this one, next time we'll talk about the war era of 1983, especially when I was running independently. Oh, Larry. And then Larry, we'll cycle back to the 60s. Larry, you misunderstood me. I meant the last edition that we did. We still have about oh. 24, 25, 26 more shows to go. So We should be done somewhere in about 2012. Yeah, there's many more shows. They, that schedule has not been changed, no matter what happens to yours <laughs> truly or, or yourself. Okay, let's go. Let's start with... Okay, all, well, let me interrupt. Oh, can can, I, sorry, can, go, I, can yeah. I throw out just a couple of quick clarifications about what we said last time? Because I made one grievous error. Yes, sir. And, and shame on me. I said something that Sam, after he had the retirement show in January of 82, the first show that he was at is not the promoter. He was there with his wife. Well, that would have been pretty hard because his wife had been dead a year. Uh, he was there with his family, meaning his kids, his daughter, and his one son who was here in St. Louis, Dr. Richard Muchnick, Dan Muchnick, living in Atlanta. He was at the show in January of 82, not with his wife, but with his family. And we also talked a little bit about the relationship between Sam and myself and the media here in St. Louis. And I, and I may have shortchanged it a little bit because I mentioned about how, you know, it was always there to say, hey, do you need a ticket or something? And sure, that was there. But it was so much more than that. It was more that we often were at the same events together, the same restaurants, or working on, say, a multiple sclerosis society event or a, a banquet of some kind where we could just sit and talk about what happened that, what do you think about that baseball trade? Geez, what about the blues and hockey? And we didn't have to talk wrestling. So it was not just me going up and saying, do you need tickets for the wrestling show? No, it was much more sophisticated than that. And that, of course, was Sam's fine hand. He had often would tell me, Larry, you're a great public relations man. Everybody likes you. They, they want to do things for you. They want to help you. He says, but you're a lousy publicity man. He says, because a publicity man's got to go in and lean on people and push them to get publicity in there, and you just don't do that. And I recognize he was right. I mean, that's my personality. That's also the way it was. And then he, Sam would tell me that, and he'd say, of course. He says, I was the same way when I was working for Tom Pax. He says, I had the connections, so they all wanted to do things for me and do favors for me. He says, but I wasn't comfortable going in and saying, hey, don't forget to give us a plug and don't forget to tell us this and don't forget to do that. He says, I couldn't do it. He says, I was a lousy publicity man. You're just like me, which was nice of him to say. And the final point, about a week ago, I did an interview with Dory Funk Jr. for a local nostalgia radio station with my friend Herb Simmons, KZQZ Radio. And Dory Jr. and I talked a lot about St. Louis. And at the end of the interview, I said to Dory, if there was one thing that you remember from when you came to St. Louis, and this ties in with the start of 82 here, obviously, but when you came to St. Louis in 1964 and 65 for the first time and through all the years you were there, what's the one memory you have of St. Louis? And he gave me a one-word answer, credibility. And that's what all this is about, St. Louis and credibility for wrestling. I apologize for that long rant. Yeah, do you have a copy of the uh, Dory interview? Uh, it can be gotten, yeah, KZQZ Radio, Herb Simmons, they would have it. And uh, 14, I mean, that 30. would be great, Larry Matisic and Dory Funk, wow. I think Dory's going to uh, actually be putting it on his website, too. At some point, you should talk to Dory. You would have a, you would have a good time with him, especially with the background you have on St. Louis. Well, I've interviewed him, but nothing could match what you could do. I mean, you saw him there in St. Louis so many times, Larry. Saw his first match, saw his last match, which, wow. of course, is what we're just going to talk about, right? Okay, here we go, August 6th. 1982, Kiel Auditorium, attendance 7,125. Not bad for August, considering our ups and downs and coming off that huge 19,000 show in, in uh, June. And the main event is Dory Funk Jr. And I believe this was his last match in St. Louis against Ric Flair for the NWA title. Flair winning it, two falls out of three. Uh, good match. Went actually probably around in the area of 35 minutes. A lot of people probably were sitting there watching and thinking, hmm, one-hour draw. Well, no. But they had a good 35-minute match. And uh, the finish, again, typical St. Louis in this case. Flair wins it with a backslide. That's simple. If you do it right, you do it at the right time. Sometimes it's not what. More often it's when and how. And that's why I worked in this match with Flair getting the win. 
Crusher Blackwell and Harley Race versus Dick the Bruiser and Dewey Robertson ended double DQ. Decent match. Uh, Dusty Rhodes beating Von Roschke and the rest of the card, the Kansas City office. Yeah, it looks a little thin for a typical St. Louis show. The ongoing battles, I, I used up a lot of my arguing powers for that uh, June show, June 1982, where Dick the Bruiser and Ric Flair were, and as we've talked about, it was a very strong card. And you can't always get your way on everything, and here's why I had a bend, and we'll talk more about that as we get into the fall here of 82, which was a really big moment. August 27th, 1982, Keel Auditorium, attendance 4,328. Well, we got talked into running that second show in August again, which we always pay a price for. And, of course, Dick the Bruiser and Harley Race have been together many times. Wasn't a terribly well-organized match. They were hitting each other with chairs, and for some reason, and I was doing ring announcing that time again, the finish got screwed up. They didn't know it was two out of three falls. I was drawing back from some of the back, room politics and doing basically on Sam's suggestion and he was probably right because he said the more you do for them the less they'll appreciate what you do you still need to back off a little bit and let them fail on their own and then perhaps they will come to their senses and offer you a a percentage of the company for what you do so anyhow they, they went the first fall they're hitting each other with chairs I get in the ring and said the first fall ends with a double disqualification each man's awarded a fall and the bruiser says to me It is only one fall. I said, no, it's two out of three. I announced that at the start. He kind of looked at me. Harley's laying on the ground because he'd just been hit with a chair. I says, just do the same thing again, and we'll call the bell. We'll disqualify everybody. So Dick says, okay, fine. So he grabbed a chair, and the next fall went 45 seconds, which basically was the bruiser hitting race with the chair seven times in the head. So then we disqualified everybody. Kind of a really Uh Uh-oh, problems, huh? Yeah, it, it was failure to communicate, partially my fault. I guess, but... Uh, well, know, wait, who who was in charge of telling the guys behind the scenes w- what would happen? Bob Geigler, Bob Brown. So why would it be partially your fault? I probably should have leaned on them more because, in theory, I was doing the booking and I'd have, I agreed to that main event. But I really thought they'd at least look at the program and they'd hear me talking about it on TV and they'd certainly hear what I announced. And this match is two out of three falls with a one-hour time limit, but obviously somebody didn't get it. So... So who takes the heat afterwards? Nobody. It just slid right by. How's it? You got 4,000 people at Keel. It's August. Is it just because it's the second card or things are starting to come unwound, right? Well, and, and we've had that roller coaster most of 1982, as the people have heard, where we'd have a couple big crowds and then we'd have a zero crowd. So that didn't help matters any. Now, Dusty Rhodes defeats Greg Valentine. I know you weren't very fond of Dusty on the show's. Uh, did the fans in St. Louis appreciate him, or he didn't yeah, get he a got reaction? He I mean, did. he got reaction, and I wasn't. I mean, don't get me wrong about Dusty. I recognize what he did. He was a very colorful performer, and he could do a lot of things that would excite a crowd. He was he was a charismatic character, okay. uh, so it was fine to have him on the card. He was a former world champion, and we really he hadn't been harmed in any way. I mean, he lost the match before almost twenty thousand people against Ric Flair back in January. That certainly didn't hurt him. And the undercard again, all Kansas City. All Kansas Spike City Huber. is all except the Kansas Huber. is the Kansas City by design to keep the cost down. Yeah, well, and to give their guys work. That's probably the biggest crowd uh, by far. Not only is it the biggest crowd they worked for during the week, probably cumulatively, it was the total number of people they'd worked for during the week all in one night with 4,300 people. They probably worked six shows that week, and I guarantee you they hadn't worked before 4,300 people during the entire week. August 1982, your relationship with Geigel and Race? Uh, Geigel, tense, contentious. Harley, fine when he's there. We, we were. Harley wasn't there that much. He's there when he went in the ring, but the rest of the time he's on the road. Uh, I don't know what, you know, things were being said at different points, but uh, it, it, it was okay. It was fine with Harley. The tension kind of was with Geigel, but maybe that was designed by design, too. We all knew we were on different paths. Oh, boy. Okay, September 5th, 1982, TV taping. Mark Romero defeats Harley Race on DQ, and Race then gets into a battle with Dick the Bruiser. Because we're going back to the Bruiser and Harley for about, what, the nine millionth time, and, of course, that was one of Harley's favorite finishes to get disqualified against a a medium-level baby face like Mark Romero and then continue to pound on him. Dick the Bruiser comes to ringside. They have a little squabble, which, in theory, should help a little bit for the 
coming battle between race and the bruiser inside the fence and with no disqualification, and it did well. Yeah, September 17th, 82, Kilo Auditorium, 9,561. Harley Race wins the Missouri title by beating well, Dick the Bruiser inside the cage or the fence. Isn't that a surprise that Harley won the Missouri title, huh? Mm, no, not yeah. really. And say something about Dick the Bruiser. Okay, in the summer of 1982, at the age of 52 years old, Dick the Bruiser has now worked before over 28,000 people on just two shows where he was the main eventer. I grant you, he was nothing. Nothing compared to what he used to be, but he still could put some butts into some seats, couldn't he? Yeah, it's really strange because he didn't mean too much anywhere else at that point, did he? We still had protected the legend, and I agree. No, he didn't really work anywhere else. He probably uh, was a partner in Chicago with Vern Gagne, so I'm sure he worked some – I know he worked some shows in Chicago. Had his Indianapolis area, which was not doing well. It was not a very good territory right. at the time. That was, that was a – Really, we were surrounded in St. Louis. He had Kansas City on one side, which wasn't doing particularly good business, and he had Dick the Bruiser in Indianapolis on the other side, which wasn't doing good business. And uh, WWA Indianapolis had been very strong in the mid-'70s, and by the 80s he was using some real uh, fringe talent. Definitely was. And, uh, yeah, it, it, was, it was a shaky Midwest. And yet you go to the north where the AWA was, Minneapolis, Chicago, Milwaukee, Omaha, Denver, what have you, and AWA was doing bang-up business in 82. And you look at the undercard, Crusher Blackwell over Dewey Robertson, Mark Romero and Bobo Brazil over Hercules and Kim Duck. Uh, you know, a lot of Kansas City talent. Yep, Bruce Reed, Roger Kirby, uh, Ivan Koloff was there, so that's something. Yeah. That, uh, it, it was not a terribly strong show. So once again, I'd say give some credit to that main event of Race and the Bruiser. They could still draw some money, but of course... You pulled out all the stops. No DQ inside the fence, so the people knew this would be a finale type match, a blow off type match. October eighth, nineteen eighty two, Checker Dome attended seventeen thousand two. We can still do it. And Harley meant a lot. Uh let's face it. The main event, Harley Race against NWA champion Ric Flair. Harley Race wins the only fall within the one hour time limit, so Flair retains the title despite losing the decision. The challenger must win two falls. Race won the only fall in 50 minutes and 11 seconds. They went one hour. Uh, Harley clearly, it was one of those situations, I mean, you can't argue, we drew. And it obviously would set the situation. Common sense would tell us you're going to bring that back at some point down the road. In our style of St. Louis thinking at the time, I would be looking at June of 1983 to bring that back at that point because in between somebody logically should knock off Harley. That makes all the sense in the world. Harley Race beat the NWA champion, even though he didn't get the belt. So if somebody beat Harley, then shouldn't he logically go against Ric Flair, which is going to lead to many arguments. And then Harley, of course, can rebound after that and still come back for the title, but it, it wasn't to be. And we had a strong undercard there, a match that, as you might recall, throughout 82, I'd been fortunate enough to be able to tease all the way, which is Andre the Giant and Crusher Blackwell. Ended up in a double countout. And our special referee, as a salute to Vern Gagne, because he wanted him on the card, was Leo Nomalini, famous football player, wrestler, uh, Hall of Fame football player, and former world heavyweight wrestling champion. And uh, not that anybody really knew him in St. Louis at that point in time. He was a favorite of Vern Gagne. Hulk Hogan wins a handicap tag bout over Greg Valentine and the great T.O. This was Gagne putting a little more pressure on and something, I mean, he and I had talked to. And I was saying, you know, it's a pretty lonely fight. If I'm asking for your guys if you don't put some pressure on for him, too. He said, well, you ought to bring in Hogan. He's doing great for us. And this was Hulk Hogan's first St. Louis match. It was fine. Of course, you look at it against Greg Valentine and the Great Teal. Like, nobody could figure out what was going to happen there. Do you happen to recall the Great Teal, Gary? Do you remember him? Uh, no, sorry. There's probably a reason you don't remember, and I bet not too many people listening remember him either. Was he a martial, was he a martial arts master? He was a short little uh, oriental wrestler mm. who came up to Hulk Hogan's knee, hip, somewhere in there, and it put Greg Valentine in a tough spot, and then things were a little bit ragged behind that too. I don't know that Hulk the, – the draw was – were the drawing power for that match was race, flair. They've already had some matches, and then you know there's history between them. People knew race could win the belt, and Andre and Blackwell, we've done a beautiful job of building up. In fact, in building that up, I had spent some time in New York 
uh, earlier, and I guess I did that probably in mid-September. I can't remember. It might have been even before that September show where I spent uh, three, four days up there. went to a Madison Square Garden show, rode to uh, Allentown, Pennsylvania for the taping with Howard Finkel, spent a lot of time with Vince McMahon Sr., because Junior, of course, was doing the commentary, and they were doing interviews all during the afternoon, and talked with Sr. quite a bit. Uh, he was very open, talked about how his idea of the office was. He had a large office staff compared to most wrestling people, but he thought there should be a very distinct line between office and talent and that both should respect the other, but he didn't like a whole lot of intermingling between them. I think that maybe has changed with his son and over the, his philosophies over the year. Neither one's right, neither one's wrong. It's just what it is. That That's just something that Vince Sr. talked about. And uh, It was, again, an educational experience to be there and just to be around and see how they operated and uh, spend some time there and, and talk a little bit in person with Vince Jr. And knowing as we were getting into 82 that things were getting dicey this well, was larry around. larry Go i ahead. gotta stop you because it i i didn't know about this meeting now we're in 82 well it uh, wasn't really a meeting I, I went up when i went up there to new york far i should have clarified that i did an interview with andre the giant that we taped in allentown and then we brought that back and played it in st louis about the match with black well andre and i did the interview and he did the usual finish where he puts his hand over your face and of course his palm is the size of your face so that was in from a business standpoint why i was there so you're there four days for one interview? Uh, that and well, and I wanted to see a Madison Square Garden card, and in fact, saw a match between one of your favorite champions, Bob Backlund, and Cowboy Bob Orton, which really was a great match. They went roughly 35 minutes with Backlund winning clean in the middle. It's the first time I'd really seen Bob Back or Bob Orton in that type of situation, and got a chance to know him a little bit. And he was married to a St. Louis girl, Elaine, and he was in the process then of moving to St. Louis. They were buying the house that they still live in, in the North St. Louis County. And obviously it made sense to me, having seen the kind of match that Bob could have with Backlund, to go 35 minutes and have that crowd screaming and yelling that we should be using Bob Orton in St. Louis. I didn't know if O'Connor and them were too thrilled about that idea, but they did have to agree, well, yes, he can work, and there is no trans involved, so... Even if he's in New York or eventually in the Carolinas, we yes, we should probably use Bob here when we can. So you go up for the four days. Okay, you went for the interview with Andre. Did you mention anything? Did Vince Sr. ask you about the problems that St. Louis was having even once? Not that I recall. Junior and I talked about it, though. And Howard Finkel and I talked about it fairly, uh, for a fair amount, pretty fair amount because we rode together for a couple of days. And what did Vince Jr. say when you said that, you know, things weren't, you know, it's that great? Apart. Well, what can I do to help? Uh, be, you know, you, you've had a long relationship with him. Uh, Sam not being there, yeah, things are going to change. I can see a lot of changes coming. No committed statement of any kind. Just a sympathetic ear. What can I do to help? Keep me advised type of thing. That's it. Yeah, I, I don't read. I mean, there were no... There was there was no subterfuge or anything going on at that particular point. I mean, just so it just started when <laughs> I always try and ask people about the lead up to the '84 wars and everything. But that's fine. I mean, you know, it, you don't you don't just decide overnight you're gonna you know attack the world. It's a kind of it takes a long time to do almost anything, uh, even back then or today. Well, or... he probably was thinking of it, but that doesn't mean he was telling me about it. And I mean, again, and we've probably touched on this this consideration a little bit, considering it was St. Louis the home of the National Wrestling Alliance, and this town where he had a prior relationship with the television station owner and Ted Koppler, he probably was thinking, well, hmm, what could happen? And he wasn't going to say, I don't think he, we didn't know each other that well. We weren't that trustworthy of each other. Oh, okay. Or he could say, well, are you thinking about double-crossing him? Maybe I could, t no, no that, that did not. So that would have been happen. risky for him to offer that up. Sure, at that point, because nobody I, I, nobody knew what was happening. Nobody knew what was going to go down. And why would he tell it to me? I mean, I'm still an NWA person. I grew up in NWA territory. I grew up Sam Muchnick's man. Why wouldn't I go back and tell Sam, who would then tell everybody else, and then all of a sudden we have a, what do we call that, a preemptive strike? Larry, what was a Madison Square Garden show in 1982 like compared to a St. Louis wrestling show, let's say when Sam was still in charge? 
You know, there was it, it was a good card. I wish I could remember who else was on it. I just really remember that Orton Backlund match because they went that length of time. Orton clearly was the heel, and the funny thing is, and Bob Orton and I have talked about this since, he probably threw two punches the whole time. I, I would guess two punches, maybe three. Everything else was moves, counter moves, building heat with bumps, and the way the way the match was orchestrated. Uh, I, I thought it was a very certainly from Orton's standpoint, and from Backlund's too, a very St. Louis-style main event where it was tight, it moved, and it was really pretty much wrestling-oriented, although there was clearly somebody who was, who was being favored and somebody who wasn't. Okay, Larry, so the main event, very good. Overall, was the card as entertaining as a classic St. Louis show? Because I'm interested, because back then... I could see the garden cards, but I never saw really anything from St. Louis out of an arena. Was there a big difference, or was it kind of the same stuff? I don't think there was a huge difference. There may have been a little bit. I just don't recall it as being a big difference. Uh, And I was actually looking for what are they doing different than us that we could steal, that we could use. That's the history of wrestling. You borrow ideas from other territories, just as wrestlers borrow moves from other wrestlers. I I didn't see at least on that one card. That big of a huge difference. I just wish I could remember better who was all on the car. I mean, what really stuck in my mind was Orton and Backline. And by the same token, I wasn't out there watching the entire car because I was in the back talking to different people at different times. Probably if there were probably eight matches on a show back then in Madison Square Garden, I actually probably watched four of them. Now, when you're in the uh, garden of Vince Sr. and Vince Jr., did they have a good relationship or they always, it was controversial? Maybe they didn't get along that well? Did we... Nothing that I. Could Nothing. sense one way or the other. I mean, I, I didn't. It seemed fine to me. They seemed tight. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I won't say that they didn't come in and hug each other. But if you're working with each other every day, you don't need to hug each other every day either. If you're father and son, maybe when they're yours, your son's age, you hug him every day. But I can't imagine it at Vince's age of at that time, thirty-seven, thirty-eight. I don't think he was getting hugged a whole lot. But no, I, I did not sense any tension. Okay. I'm gonna one more question. Vince Senior, as sharp as Vince Junior, or Vince Junior, as it turns out. I mean, was Vince, what do you think? Senior, especially at that point, was more polished into a quiet, dignified presence. Vince Jr. was younger, and I think the energy level showed more, where Senior came from a different era, and he was just uh, more laid back, looking around, paying attention, clearly in charge of things, uh, but not having to show it where Junior, a little bit more outgoing. The funny thing was when we uh, got in for the, inter- the interviews, they started taping in the afternoon for the various towns in their circuit. They began taping interviews in the afternoon. Uh, Howard got me there. Uh, we went over, and all the guys were waiting around, and uh, no Junior. And I can't remember who I talked to. I can't think who was working there. It might have been Ken Patera. Whoever I was talking to at the time said, oh, it's no big deal. We know we're told to be at a certain time. We're going to hang out for an hour or two because Junior's never on time. He was always late. Everybody had to wait for Junior. Okay, fair enough. Now we go back to St. Louis, and in the notes there's a comment about Vern. Yeah, and, and a couple things were happening okay. because at this point in October, I knew it was going to fall apart. Uh, Sam was saying, let them fall, let them fail on their own, let them fall on their own, be patient. And I would, I'd back away for a show or two, a couple of tapings, but it just hurt so much to see some of the cards and, and that it just didn't have the fire. And you have one of those bad cards with 4,000 people and you knew why. And there's the lure of doing the booking, uh, with everything else. I just could not resist it. It's magic. It's, it's fun to do. It's fun to see your ideas start to happen with great performers. Uh, the politics of who to use, of who was going to be the CPA, whether it was going to be Richard Kawanishi or somebody from Kansas City. That kept going on, who to hire in the office, so I had help. So we, we didn't have to leave the office empty when I had different, uh, different responsibilities to do outside the office. And it was during this period that Sam told me, I will not be coming back as consultant at the end of the year. And that was when I basically decided I needed to look at other options. Where was Vern with all this going on, knowing there were problems? Pretty much quiet, outside of wanting to get No Molini used, and we should use Hogan, and maybe use a couple more pieces of talent. But I wonder, his hands were tied. He was not, he was in a minority partner position. 
he only owned roughly 25%, probably 27 28% at the time. And I think he was mainly just staying out of the way because he knew something was going to happen, and maybe he'd be in a position when it was all over just to pick up the pieces and put it back together. So stay friendly with those guys, stay friendly with me, stay friendly with Sam, and let's try not to make any enemies. Okay, October 22nd, 1982, Keel Auditorium, a catastrophe, attendance 3,499. A real stinker, and Hulk Hogan was in the semifinals. So let's not hear about how Hulk Hogan came into St. Louis in 1982 and blew it off the roof. No, he meant nothing. Ken Patera in the main event against Crusher Blackwell, a match that never, it just never worked. They were much better together as a team, but Vern was doing that in Minneapolis, so we got to do it here. Uh, the co-feature of semifinal, really, Hulk Hogan and Dick the Bruiser against Dewey Robertson and Greg Valentine when Hogan beat Robertson. All along, as you might have noticed, Dewey Robertson has been a babyface. And just, boom, overnight he's a heel. Why? Because they did an angle in Kansas City where he switched. But, of course, did anybody in St. Louis know anything about that? No. And you look at this match before, Hogan in a handicap match beat Greg Valentine and that master of the martial arts, Great Teal, well, now you put Hulk Hogan and Dick the Bruiser on the same team against Greg Valentine and Dewey Robertson, huh? And that was one of the match. That's this is a card where I do what you want. And, of course, here we are in the second match on the card, Kansas City's own Manny Fernandez beating Freebird Terry Gordy. Now, what sense did that make? Now, it says no music for Terry Gordy. No, what? he was just Terry Gordy. Why sometimes did you, like Michael Hayes, you have the music, Terry Gordy, no because I didn't argue about it and say that, you know, geez, we did it for Hayes. We really got to do it for Guardy. got to give Guardy. I kept my mouth shut because I knew things were – I was trying my best to not get involved. Because Terry Gordy at the time, a huge star in the business. Oh, yeah, in the same line. I think World Class Wrestling had already started airing in St. Louis. So he could have, should have meant something, but uh, it was – it was. Uh, I don't know what the thinking was. and I was trying to stay out of the thinking, but always getting lured back in. Uh, you couldn't stay away, even though – during this period, I'm talking with Charlie Mancuso, the manager of the Checker Dome, and also the president of a couple of companies, one called Charger Advertising and another called Charger Promotions, which were Charlie and Jerry Couch, his assistant, his secretary. And they basically were financed by Delaware North Sports Service. So they not only were managing the Checker Dome, but they were also running an advertising company and doing some promotions on their own. And obviously, Charlie becoming a great friend and knowing of all the frustration and talking to Sam all the time, talking to me all the time, Jerry Couch, seeing her all the time. Uh, they were a fallback position for me in terms of friendship. And Charlie and I were starting to think, Charlie knowing that I'm thinking, hey, this is 1945 all over again. This thing's falling apart. Do I have the guts to step out on my own? But then you got to have financial backing. And... The financial banking situation, the situation that we could do through Charger Advertising, Charger Promotions, Larry Matisic, Charlie Mancuso, backed by Delaware North, things were starting to fall into place at this point in time over October, November so, of 1982. So you're working for, you're working with Bob Geigel. Mm -hmm. Shame on me, huh? It's wrestling, folks. What can I tell you? <laughs> Well, no, not shame on you. You got to take, you know, you're just a regular guy, Larry. You got to take care of yourself. So you've got Charlie Mancu Mancuso. Mm -hmm, that's correct. And how does how what are these conversations like? Do you guys meet at some, you know, restaurant in the back room, or do you? No, meet I just went and sat in his office at the Checker Dome. Don't forget, they ever had hockey season already started. I'm at practically every hockey game anyway, so I can just stop up in the office, and uh, you know, my wife Pat and I be there, and. She'd be talking to some of the people in the, the sales staff or the marketing staff that she knew and become friends with. And, you know, I'd sit with Charlie maybe a couple nights, sit in the owner's box with him, and uh, things falling apart. How? And, uh, Charlie asked me, how could you get by drawing 3,000 people? Are you going nuts? And I'm going nuts. Yes. So who, so who approached to as far as, hey, did well, you're talking, so you're talking about something. Who's yeah. the first one to say, hey, let's, let's. Me. So how would you say it to him? Do you think there's any interest there? I mean, to do something like this, and then explaining all the potential pitfalls, all the things that can go wrong, how you're going to lose money, how it would be a horrible war because I would suddenly be the outsider. And, you know, there would, that if we did this, if we really take this step, and even looking at other options, 
Uh, and it was funny, and I, I, I wish I could remember this time period. And I don't know if it happened before I left or after. It was late 82 or early 83. Ted Koppler, the owner of Channel 11, also knew things were not going smoothly. Because, again, I also had close friends at Channel 11, in particular Jim Winkle, who had been our director for years and then was the head of production. And Ted knew it. And at one point, Ted even said, why don't you just leave them? We got a contract with St. Louis Wrestling Club for another year or so. He said, I'm going to get back into kickboxing. He said, I may get a deal with Chuck Norris. Why don't you come with us and work promotions with us, and you can do the TV for the kickboxing operation? Well, no, Charles, or, uh, Ted, my, my love's still wrestling. That's, that's where my passion is. And uh, so it was a nice offer, and it was very courteous on his part. But, yeah, now it's what was, happen- <clears throat> Excuse me. It's what was happening behind the scenes more than it was the wrestling in a lot of ways. So the first I'm time it affected the wrestling. So the first time you say to Charlie, "Hey, what do you think? Wh- what's he say? Ah, or yeah, or no, or he's excited." Because don't forget, he's young too. We're both young and feeling our oats, man. You know, this is the time, and he's worked closely with me. He's seen what we've done on these shows, and he knows what my role in it had been, and he knows hopefully where some of the, the weaknesses are because they're all sorry. Nobody can do it all. So, so the first time you say you must have been nervous approaching him with this, right? I was hesitant, and I, and, I, and, and again, your mind, if you we're talking 20, we're only talking 20, 28 years ago here, Gary. Uh, you know, I, Sam is aware of some of these conversations, too, with Charlie. And he sees, and I mean, he's just fed up with the whole situation. He doesn't like what's happening in St. Louis. And I think probably today there are still some ill feelings on those who are still around on the St. Louis, from the St. Louis Wrestling Club who feel that Sam took their money selling his stock to them, and then didn't stay and fight for them or keep from happening what did happen. Did Sam have an obligation to do that? Well, he did stay for a year, and he told them over and over, you should give Larry more money, you should give him a piece of the action, let him run St. Louis. If it gets screwed up, then you have a reason to fire him because you still have control. But he should have part of the action. He knows how the town runs. And we go back to this whole thing of credibility that Dory Funk Jr. talked about and part of that credibility could have slipped away. I mean, I'm, I'm still paying the bills, but it's also squeezed on every show. I'm, they're keeping money in it, but it's not like Sam when you had that $5,000 zero or $5,000 equal zero. You know, it was maybe a couple or $3,000. But I was paying the bills and doing the right things, but it was hard to do. So so the first night you say it to Charlie and he's excited, what, what do you go home and tell your wife? Oh, man, we're in luck or are you – Oh, we've been talking. I mean, and, and she knows too. It's a tremendous gamble, either – it may fail. Wait, did Char- but did Charlie definitely at that point have the, the resources to, to compete? Well, Delaware North most assuredly had the resources to compete. I mean, every, everybody listening here has a sports franchise probably in their town where the concessions are run by Delaware North Sports Service, which is their and, operative name. Delaware North is their corporate name. And how was Charlie tied in with them? They, they, they had the management contract for the Checker Dome. Charlie was hired by them. They, in turn, financed through their money any ventures that he wanted to do through Charger Advertising or Charger Promotions. If he wanted to do a, a truck show, if they wanted to do a play that went in the Fox Theater or something like that, they would fund it through Charger. They would front it. They would be the guy that put up the uh, seed money were and you, would guarantee them against loss. Were you certain that Charlie was in tight enough with them that this could happen, or was it just risky that maybe it couldn't happen? Well, it wasn't something that happened overnight. As we talked about it, and it, it, I started to realize that Charlie was good with them, and the confidence level built over a okay, period of okay. time. Let's get, let's do some more of the matches, and then we'll get to this, okay? Yeah, it is, yeah, it's a totally different end from okay. wrestling. Yet, what is happening affects wrestling. Okay, November fifth, nineteen eighty-two. That's where we start up again, right? Mm-hmm. Keel Auditorium attendance four thousand one hundred thirteen. Ouch! Another stinker. Uh, Butch Reed in the main event against Harley Race. Race being disqualified, therefore he keeps the Missouri title. We've seen that finish a few times. Ivan Koloff and Greg Valentine against Dick the Bruiser and Mark Romero in the semifinal. Well, I wonder why it didn't draw. And Crusher Blackwell against Buzz Tyler, third from the top. I wonder why it didn't draw. And the rest of the card totally outside of Spike Huber, Kansas City. Yeah, it's Kansas City, which couldn't draw anything anywhere, right? Yeah, and, and Butch, well, he's getting a push. He's not even Butch Reed then. We're still calling him Bruce Reed. And uh, so he's, it, it's good. It's great to get him started. And it's great that Harley, you know, treated him as an equal. 
And I'm not saying that Harley should have lost him because he should not have, but did it make any sense to have him disqualified either? It, it was the wrong match at the wrong time. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't serving a purpose. Larry, did way. fans pull you aside? Did they get to talk to you like, hey, Larry, what the heck's going on here? What, what? I don't recall that. They may have sensed. They, they, they knew something. It didn't make sense that we'd have these huge cards where a lot of good people were on, and then we'd have these cards where, ooh, what happened? But I don't really recall any specific feedback from any individuals, no. November 19th, 1982, Kiel Auditorium. Now, this should be a big show right around Thanksgiving. Six it's thousand, also a big one for us. 6,328. And it's Ric Flair defending the NWA title against Ken Patera. Uh, and I'm glad Ken got the chance, and he'd wrestled for the title against Race a few times. Ken really, really he really wasn't the baby face. He's a much better heel. That's, that's number one. So we didn't do him any favors there. They had a decent match. In fact, they trained together. They broke into wrestling together, training with Vern Gagne at his, at his gym. So, you know, it was okay. There was nothing wrong with the match. There was nothing right with the match, if that makes sense. Not that it, right from the, terms of, from the terms of aesthetically, it was a good match to watch. It was an entertaining evening. It was an entertaining match. They were good together. But it was the wrong match from the standpoint of, will this draw money? It's interesting because they both broke in together. That's correct. Ken was probably the superior athlete. Yes. And yet Ken's career at this point almost over, and Ric Flair still wrestles today. What are the That's, odds of that? Ric Flair is not a normal human being to be wrestling at the age of 62. That's all I can say. I mean, you know, but uh, he's an amazing character. There's no question about I, that. I don't, I don't get – I've asked a lot of people this, and I never get a good answer because there is no good answer. But, like, I interviewed Ken, and Ken's great, but you can hear him, like, you know, the pain, and he's been out of the ring for 20 years, and yet Ric Flair's ready to go 60 minutes probably next Monday night if they'd give him the chance to get out of that wheelchair. <laughs> with that little routine they're doing over there. Yeah, which really stinks. But uh, And by the way, every time you say uh, that I don't like Bob Backlund, I get more of an appreciation for him as I uh, scan the uh, the uh, the uh, cable airwaves on Monday night. So, Well, you have a different perspective now. You're older now, and you're looking for different things. And what you, what you see now is, I'm, I'm, believe me, when we go back in the 63, 64, and I will always preface any remarks I make about wrestling 62, 63, 64, I remember it this way. But I was also 16 years old, so maybe I was a little prejudiced one way, although I had already started working for Sam and I was starting to learn. But certainly how I looked at wrestling in 63, 64, 65 was a hell of a lot different than how I looked at it in the fall of 1982. Now on this November 19th card, King Kong Brody's back. He beats Mark Romero. And that's the start of a push for Brody against Flair at the Checker Dome in February. The original plan was to build Kerry Von Erich for that title shot. Uh, Harley was the stumbling block because I argued that it made sense to put Kerry Von Erich over for the Missouri title. Harley's coming off, for, he just beat Ric Flair, right? And didn't get the title because he got the only fall an hour. So if you're going to go to the Checker Dome, where you really want to have at least 14,000, 15,000 people, the logical thing is to have Kerry get a big win and have people say, he's, oh, he's young enough, and now he's gone over this peak, and he's strong enough that he can win the world title. Well, Harley didn't want to do it. He said, I don't want to turn into Jack Briscoe. I don't believe I should lose. Da, 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 da. Okay, even though in his own history it had happened repeatedly, and he still was drawing matches with the World Championship. I shouldn't say repeatedly, but it happened once in a while at the right time when it meant something. So in this case, he still wouldn't give on it. And I argued about it, and now I'm getting drawn back into it. So as we went back and forth about how we can get carry over, I said, if we're going to get carry on the Missouri title on carry, if it's going to be by disqualification, it's a chintzy way to do it. Why don't we just hold Kerry and try to build Kerry for something in either April, let him, have a, let him have the Missouri title, let him have a couple wins over other opponents, other challenges where he doesn't have to work with Harley. And who can we get up that quick? There's nobody can get up that quick for February. I said, well, what about Brody? He gets over fast. And that was how we got Brody to come in for that February date. Uh, they were a little hesitant, especially Bob Geigel, because it all has been problems with Kansas City. And at that point, Harley also came up with the deal that he would work with the Giant Baba on February 11th because they'd done something with the PWF, the Pacific Wrestling title, where Harley had beaten Baba in Japan. This would be a return of the favor where Baba would beat Harley in his home territory. They would tape that match. They would also tape the Flair and Brody match, send that back to Japan, 
and it would be a big deal on Japanese TV, which in 1982 for all for all Japan, which is what the Baba promotion was, the t- the tape, the promotion, they were on fire. <clears throat> so that was the plan. In Japan. In Japan to take it back. Yeah, Japan was on fire, right, in the early 80s? Yeah, right. And this would show Baba beating race in okay. St. Louis and whatever Flair and Brody would do. I'd made the argument for Brody. It worked. But as we went into November and December, I told Brody, I'm not going to be here then. Sam leaves January 1, Larry leaves 2. And I'd become good enough friends with Frank by that time. We talked, we talked. He said, you got to stay, you got to stay through February. Let's get this done right. If I can get this done right. I told him that I'm looking at breaking away, and the odds are growing on a daily basis that I might run opposition. Might get my butt kicked. Probably will get my butt kicked, but i got to try it. I have to see what happens. And Brody told me then, he says, I appreciate you staying with me. If you stay through February, brother, I am with you forever. And whatever you want to say about Frank Goodish, he was a man of his word. I kept my word to him, and for the next six years of his life, which was way too tragically ended soon, he kept his word to me. Why did he? Why was it so important to him that you're there February 11th? Yeah, because he knew that these guys, if if they were handling the promotion for it, to get screwed up instead of having a nice big crowd while oh. he's wrestling Flair, there'd be half a house. And, I mean, he'd been with me. I'd set him up on commercials and everything by then. We've probably talked about that. and He'd seen how the town, the town worked, and he was smart enough to understand how the town worked. And we were becoming pretty friendly at this point. And I was explaining. I didn't have to explain it. He saw it. He, he was a smart man. He saw it, and he was a rebel. He was an outlaw. And somewhere deep down in him, he's thinking, hell yes, Larry, go out there and start a fight. It'll be good for wrestling, and it'll be good for me. I'm sure he was thinking that, too. And uh, so I I agreed that I'd stay with it. And there was some fun and satisfaction with it, setting up Brody to get to that match with Flair. I got to get Bob Orton on the show here in St. Louis. I got Rick Martell started in St. Louis. Would they have used them without me? I'm sure they'd have used Bob Orton simply because he lived here. I don't know how far they'd have gone with him, which would have been a shame. And, of course, we see it didn't really matter. And the same thing with Rick Martell. I don't know that Rick would have been a huge superstar, but if we'd have stayed the course with him, I'm sure he could have gotten main events that meant something here and might well have been able to be a very viable challenger for a heel champion on a Keel Auditorium card where he could have drawn nine, ten thousand 10,000 people. Oh, yeah, for sure. I believe that. Yeah, Rick was, Rick was good. Rick especially was in those really days. good. He could fly. He was hot. He had the had look. He was good. So all this is going on in November. You talk about tension. I can feel it right now. I, I, I remember it in my gut right now as we so, were going through this era. So what's going on in the office, Larry? The attendance is lousy for all these shows. Is Geigel blaming you? Are you blaming Geigel? Or somebody's got to be taking the heat. Eh, nobody's blaming anybody. It's just kind of sitting there. We're going through it. You know, and they're still making money. Amazing. You know, you, you have a couple of those bad shows. But then you're coming off a 17,000 people show at the, the, the arena, at the Checker Dome, excuse me, and 19,000 at the Checker Dome. So in the end, probably when they add up the money they've made for the year, even with the bad shows, they've still had one hell of a year financially for them individually. Well, and plus they're used to Kansas City payoffs, which, uh, you know, Empty. They're not feeling, yeah, they're not feeling the roller coaster effects. Every time we have one of those bumps with a 4,000, 5,000 house, I'm sick. I mean, it's just, oh, I know we could have avoided that. I should have, I should have done this. No, I shouldn't have done that because it was, just, it was just a constant tug and pull. And, I mean, by the time we get into December, I know, I know I'm going. It's just a question of will I run. And Bob Geigel in Kansas City never saw 4,000 people in the stand. So he's like, oh, it's pretty good even when it stinks, you know? Well, the building only held a couple thousand. Yeah. But he, he very seldom saw a couple thousand. Either once in a while when Brody was there, or once in a great while they'd catch something. Maybe did, you, did you ever go to any of those Kansas City shows over the years? Uh, in the mid-'70s. They went up there. I did some TV for them, and I think we may have talked about that even when we did the uh, something in the mid '70s. So we might be repetitive here. Was Although, well, the, no, but if it, anybody's listening, all of them, we apologize well, for they, repeating. They yeah, I saw a couple of them. And that was enough. They they are, but Larry, but we do forget, and I do forget. So how was the energy in the? I remember watching Kansas City TV on um, on cable in the '80s. The energy was like horrible. The ener- the first word that popped into my head for all the psychologists out there was tedious. That's how I found the matches and the promotion. Tedious. They just, it was, it was a, 
grinding night. Painful to watch. It was a grinding night. Ugh. I never okay. felt that way in St. Louis. Okay, December 3rd, 82, Keel Auditorium. Uh, you know, and I'm going along with Butch Reed now, and Dick the Bruiser and Butch Reed win a tag match from Ric Flair and Crusher Blackwell. Uh, attendance 55, 21, that kind of sucks. Uh, but, you know, could have been... Uh, could it have been worse? Uh, yeah, maybe a little. It will be later. Uh, and I remember putting this, I, I still remember just putting in this finish and sitting with these four guys in the room and feeling that I needed to explain why we did things. And the bruiser is sitting there looking at me saying, well, that's the right thing to do. Because the first fall, Blackwell pins bruiser. Second fall, bruiser pins Flair. Third fall, Reed pins Blackwell. So he never directly pinned Flair to earn a crack at Ric Flair. But because what he did, he knocked uh, Flair down right before he was able to get the pin on Blackwell. In the end, of the four, everybody hopefully got something except for Flair. And, and again, that's where I learned something about Ric Flair, both perhaps good and perhaps, I don't want to say a weakness, but one of the things that led to how he was used, I said to Rick, you know, the only bad thing out there after these three falls, you don't get anything out of the falls. You say, well, I'm the champion. I don't need it. I got the belt. Because he was the only guy who lost the fall and never won a fall where Reed was the only guy who did not lose a fall, and he won the deciding fall. So the idea was to put Butch Reed over in a match with where he was one of four spectacular people, Dick the Bruiser being a legend. I guess I shouldn't call him spectacular. But he was in the company of people who were known main eventers, and he was the guy who came out on top. And then you've got a lot of Kansas City talent underneath. Let's say I... Uh... And Cowboy Bob Orton making a St. Louis debut. Okay, let's say I'm sitting there just watching it. Are are the matches in the ring? You got a, you got a smaller crowd. Are the matches in the ring still good? I mean, is it entertaining or is it kind of boring at times? Well, I think it's entertaining. I think my vision to talk about it is probably prejudiced and probably skewed because of what I was going through politically and business wise behind the scenes. I don't know that I can honestly and openly rate these matches. I mean, the guys worked hard. It was still St. Louis. It still meant something. I didn't feel it had the fire, but maybe that was partially me. I mean, I thought that main event was pretty good, but then I'm prejudiced. Uh, it it didn't feel the same to me. I can't speak for the people out there, but I uh, now you're involved in so much of a uh, personal situation that you're not you're looking at it from a different perspective, which I was and. I don't know that I can give you an honest answer on that. You'd have to ask a fan who was watching the match better than me. Okay, December 5th, 1982, Sam Muchnick announces his resignation as consultant to the St. Louis Wrestling Club. How does he announce that? Just that he's decided to step down, and he hopes things work out. He's getting older, and he's just stepping out. It was a very brief, very brief announcement. But we did put it on the air because by now I know – that we're pretty well going to do some business with Charlie Mancuso, that I'm almost surely going to run. And I thought, well, if you're going to do it, you're going to do it. We're going to, we can't just have Sam disappear. It's Sam Muchnick, for God's sake. It's St. Louis. You don't just have Sam disappear overnight. So how does it go from you and Chuck, because now we're going to go back to Charlie. You guys are talking. You need the outside financing of the company Charlie has access to. How does this, how has this been getting clarified over the last couple of weeks? Yeah, Charlie's talking to the people who put up the money through Charger Advertising. Uh, the Jacobs family, which came at that time out of Buffalo, and I think they they also own the Boston Bruins. I think they still own the Boston Bruins. The family does. It's the Jacobs family that's involved with the uh, Delaware North Sports Service operation. He's clearing it with whatever powers that be there that are you willing to put up money to run a wrestling promotion, and he's, I guess, selling me to them and selling what's happened and that Wrestling is about to change. And, of course, off and on, I'm talking to, guess who? Vince. So he knows this is happening, too, because by this time I'm pretty open about it. Okay, I mean, now we're getting into it. Saying, please don't tell anybody. No, no, this is between you and me, and I, under I understand your frustration. I see why you're going to do it. You really need to have TV, Larry. Uh, and I remember him saying that to me often. And uh, you know, I said, well, that's something we still have to work on to develop. Okay, so, so you're talking to Charlie, and Charlie, <laughs> did you meet with the guys with the money? Did you meet personally with them? I remember meeting with uh, one of their vice presidents or something. I mean, the, the head guys, they're long. Did you, you only meet with them at the World Series or the National Hockey League uh, Stanley Cup Finals. Did you tell them what type of money you were going to need? I certainly went over with them, and I know Sam went in and talked with them, too, that you know this could be a very expensive proposition because you're going to need television, and if it works... It's not going to work in three months. It's not going to work in six months. It might be two years. So are you willing 
are you willing to put up with that much loss for that length of time? Was Sam at this point going to have anything to do with it, or did he say, I can't because I sold the company? I cannot because I sold the company. I would not compete with them. My heart will be with you, and when the time is right, I'll happen to be on your television show if you get a television show, and I will talk to you. And I think he probably talked to them, too, without telling them what I was going to do, because when we get to January, I'm going to mention something that has never come out before until this moment. Ooh. It's a very small matter, I guess, but Sam was, I admit, sympathetic, and I'm sure anybody from Kansas City hearing this now is is pulling their hair. But he was totally unhappy with the direction the promotion had gone. Did... In December, would Charlie have had the ability to keep uh, Racing Geigel out of the Checker Dome? Oh, yeah. So if you went with him, and you're going to go with him. Yep. Now, do, don't tell me how it turns out, but tell me from your point of view, December of 82, did you think, well, we'll fix them. They won't be able to get into the Checker Dome. Well, wasn't I, we fixed them. I was thinking about, have I got a place to run? And Charlie was saying, yeah, we will, and we can outfit the Checker Dome. It could be set up in a couple of different ways for smaller houses. And we even talked about if we get TV, how we could set it up, because we'd either have to do it somewhere, and ideally we'd have Channel 11. But I also recognize there's a contractual agreement. And obviously there would be some hesitance. Why would they go with me? I'm still the young guy on the block. The other ones were the established people. So now, now those the, things are all still in flux. Yeah, and the thing is, you know, looking at it now, you would think, well, if you have the big arena and you've got the money behind you, it would be no problem signing <laughs> the talent. <laughs> But back then, there was still the WWF, AWA, and the NWA was coming apart at the seams a little bit. But the talent would be taking a risk potentially by going with you, right or wrong? Absolutely. And Sam and and I talked about that a lot. And wasn't that a major – that was a major concern, right? Right. And I I would tell – I told Sam, and this is probably towards the end of December as we were going to 1983 – Brody's with me. I can count. He said, oh, I don't think you can count on Brody. I don't know because he wasn't sure. But, again, he didn't know our personal relationship. I said, well, I at least got Brody. And that I'm sure of. And, well, I hope so. You know, but you're going to have to make talent connections. And they, the talent connections hadn't started at that point. Really, that would be more deeply in 83 after I left the St. Louis Wrestling Club and in the interim before I started where I made the connections with uh, Joe Blanchard and, and uh, Angelo Poffo and different people like that. So that really was, that part wasn't happening now past talking to just those few people I could trust, which in particular was Brody, and to a certain extent, David Von Erich. But, but the, you knew that guys like uh, Flair, Race, uh, they forget, well, they're, no, they're off limits. You're Dory they're Funk, Jack Brisk, you're not going to get them, right? Hey, I flat out knew, and Sam knew. And this is the way it had been when Sam started in 1945. Hey, those first couple shows, if you can get off the ground, they are going to stink. You're going to be lucky to draw 3,000 people. You'll be happy drawing 3,000 people, 4,000 people. That's just the reality of the situation. At this point, I'm thinking I might have to scrape the bottom of the barrel for talent. didn't quite work out that way. It was much better than I anticipated and much better quickly because, as you said, the NWA was starting to fall apart. And luckily, I knew some guys, Brody first and foremost among them, and very closely behind him, bless his heart, and he's gone too, is Dick Murdoch. Yeah, well, who, okay. Murdoch gonna... Murdoch told me right away when I talked to him, probably in, in the early part of January. You run, I'm with you. Has he been with those other guys a long time? He said, "Ah, screw them, I'm with you." Okay, we're gonna get to that. We gotta save that for '83. Did yeah, you? Yeah, um... good. Well, we want to get into. We want to get through February. Now, let's get through February here, Gary. Oh, we're gonna keep going. Yeah, let's get through February and save the war for its own. Let, let's let's run it because we don't have that much more. Is that okay with you? Yeah, this is this is like a, a great movie. I'm really enjoying it. So let's, <laughs> let's hold on. Let let me get back on track here. We're gonna go January first, eighty three. Correct. Okay, NWA champion Ric Flair beats Butch Reed, uh, eleven thousand twenty nine. Big show, sellout. And Butch had gotten hot, and we did a little thing on TV and put a lot of this back to Ric Flair. We did a thing on TV where we did an amateur wrestling workout between Butch Reed and Ric Flair, which ended up in a scuffle between Flair and Reed. Flair had all this charisma. Butch Reed was just starting to come into his own. He'd been hot in Florida. It was time to give him a push, and uh, it worked. Rick Flair against Butch Reed. With a semifinal, it made a lot of sense. Kerry Von Erich against Harley Race in the Missouri title. Kerry winning by disqualification as Race kept his title. And King Kong Brody right underneath that with a win over Crush Ayala. 
And I got Rick Martell in for the first time, and he gets a win over Roger Kirby. I don't know how we ever beat somebody from Kansas City. Don't ask me how we did that. I, I think Rick Martell, great, one of the great underrated talents of all time. I liked him a lot. I, as I said, I thought he was a solid main eventer. And we had a good tag match there. Greg Valentine and Cowboy Bob Orton beating Dick the Bruiser and Bulldog Bob Brown when Valentine beat Brown. And so you, I pushed a little bit more, even though I didn't think I was going to be there at that point, and I knew I was going to leave. The week after that show, okay. Sam Muchnick had told me this was going to happen if I wished it to happen. I went to his house, and I want to say it was a Tuesday or Wednesday after that January 1st show, and I met with Buddy Fuller, one of the Welches, the father of Ron and Robert Fuller, who was the promoter in the Alabama, Mobile, Pensacola, Florida area, had a territory, and had been in many a wrestling battle. Sam's thought was, you ought to at least talk to him. He would have talent. It would give you a quarter workaround. Sam, we went to Sam's house. I sat down with Buddy Fuller. Sam introduced us. I'd never met Buddy before. And he left. He went to lunch or went out to hang out with his haircut buddy or whatever he did. And, Ron, and Buddy Fuller and I were there for the day. And it was an educational meeting. I mean, we talked about talent. He said he'd supply talent. And he'd book it for me. I said, well, that's part of the problem. Uh, as far as booking it, uh, I feel that I can book St. Louis, at least have a lead on it where I understand what should be done in a general sense. He says, oh, no, he says, you need me to book for it and shoot angles for you. I says, well, no, that's not going to work here. And that, and plus the fact that he wanted a third, he wanted a third of the operation, that's where it died. But we had a nice cordial meeting, and I asked him to please keep quiet on things for the time being. He says, oh, sure. He says, hey, I understand what you're doing. I understand why you're frustrated. Just so you understand where I'm coming from. If I stick my nose into this, I want to get something out of it, too. I said, well, I understand that. But it was an interesting meeting and, and you know, meeting some of the, uh, the so-called outlaws of wrestling to a certain extent. How, how old was Buddy at the time? Oh, wow. That's a darn good question. I would guess 60-ish, something like that. Because they're kind of a confusing family in the history of oh, wrestling. I get lost in that, too. The Welches and the, yeah. all that. I totally get lost in that, too. I completely get lost. But they, but, they ran, just so... Uh, fans understand they ran like Al Alabama right and they also were involved in the Tennessee thing and there were so many promotional wars in Tennessee Kentucky Alabama and Buddy was in the middle of them or not in the middle of them or providing talent or not providing talent so he was a guy who'd been through it and uh, it was an interesting conversation did, did you ever ask Sam hey Sam I don't need to talk to him I need to talk to you why don't you know you you no, I knew Sam wasn't going to call anybody and I understood that that period was he couldn't do it no he couldn't do it it they, my fight, I'm on my own. Sam will be happy to talk to me and advise me and give me moral support and when the time's right and never do anything to hurt me. But why couldn't he do it? Well, he felt an obligation. I don't know if there's a non-compete clause. I'm sure there was not a non-compete clause in there, but that was an obligation he felt he had to do. I'm sure if you talk to the Kansas City people, they would say that he had an obligation to do much more than that. So you don't think there was a non-compete? You just think that he just didn't really he felt want... that was too much. Mm. He felt that was too much. Well, I'm not going to ask you now, but I'm going to ask you later if it would have made a difference. But I, I don't want to know now. Okay, that's let's, fair enough. Let's go January 21st, 83. And we're basically just setting up for the uh, February match. King Kong Brody beating Bobby Duncan. And here's Kerry Von Erich getting the Missouri title by disqualification. The disqualification rule has been waived, and the title could change hands on disqualification. Oh, my goodness gracious. The trouble is when the finish comes, it's ho-hum. It's not roaring because he got a win. He pinned him. I mean, it's a disqualification. I want to check what exactly disqualification was for here so I don't misinterpret it. Okay. Harley Race was disqualified for jumping onto Carey from the top rope. That had been a disqualification in St. Louis for 40 years. Why would anybody believe that Harley Race, knowing he could lose the title in disqualification, is jumping from the top rope? It doesn't work. Ouch. Yeah, it doesn't work. But it did. So. Yeah. But we got the title on Kerry Von Erich, and uh, by that point, I already knew it was over. So I was, I was just getting through February 11th. Did you tell anybody it was over? Uh, Sam knew it. My wife knew it. Yeah, but oh, did you tell Brody Geigo? No, not yet. I, I okay. would tell them. I, I believe I sent them a letter of resignation. I want to say I gave it to them February 12th. Okay, so let's see. I'm at January. I got TV taping. January 30th, TV taping. Cowboy Bob Orton and Roger Kirby. Go to a draw with Kerry and Spike Huber. Yeah, I tried to leave him something in the bank. You know, I got Orton and Kerry Von Erich into a battle. I thought it would be helping Bob. So, I, 
you know, I'm trying to leave him something in the bank for whatever that's worth. Uh, Orton and Kerry was a logical main event to follow uh, the February 11th show at the Checker Dome. Now we've got February 11th, 1983. You're still with the company, right? This is the last, well, it's actually the second last one, but... Yeah, okay, this, okay. This Checker end. Dome, 16,695, NWA champion Ric Flair, one-hour draw with King Kong Brody. Brody wins the first fall, Flair wins the second fall on a count-out. They go to the time limit. An incredibly, incredibly hot crowd. Anybody who wants to see it, volume 12 of Classic St. Louis Wrestling, go to highspots.com. About 53 minutes, the last 53, 54 minutes, that one-hour match are all there, plus the introductions. The introductions almost blew you out of the water. The amazing thing about that is, and look at the TV, we shot no angle. Nothing. Zero. Zilch. Brody won a bunch of, match, won, won a bunch of matches. Flair had been the champion for a while. It was based totally on their personality that people wanted to see that match. We drew almost 17,000 people. Amazing. And yeah. Giant Baba did beat Harley Race for the PWF title in a horrible match. Mm. It was good politically for Harley. I understand that. It was bad for St. Louis. He couldn't do a pin with Kerry Von Erich, but he could let Baba pin him with a clothesline. I recognize in, Saint, in Japan they understood what that move was. In St. Louis, I still remember the reaction to that finish. It was like, what? It's over? But, you know, that's the way it was. It was politics, and Harley was big in Japan. I understand why he did it. I certainly don't criticize him. He did what he felt he had to do for his business, and that's fine. Now, was this one of the rare times that the video crew was there to tape? Well, Japan hired a crew from Channel 11. Uh, the Japanese man, I wish I could remember his name right now. I'd have to dig up the, the files. They actually came in, and Channel 11 set up the crew, got the truck and everything else. It was done through Hal Prater, the general manager, and Jim Winkle. The highlight of that was when they came to pay, they were going to pay in advance. And so I met Mr. Whoever it was, Saito or something, Mr. Somebody. And we walked over to the Channel 11 studio from our office at the Chase. And we sat down with Hal Prater. And I'm thinking he's going to write a check or have a cashier's check. He opened up the briefcase and he paid Hal Prater, the general manager, $7,200, whatever it was, in cash. I saw Prater's eyes. He's, I don't believe this either. But they were Wait, paid. How, how much again? Yeah, it was, it was somewhere in the $7,000 area okay. was, was what it cost for the production for the night. And they only taped, I think, three matches, uh, Kerry Von Erich and Greg Valentine, Harley Race and Giant Bob, and the Flair Brody match. And are all those matches on that videotape or just no, the only, one? only the Flair Brody. What happened to the other two? We just didn't put them on. I don't think Harley would want that match with Bob put on anyway. Uh, it was a terrible match. And I've actually never seen a tape of it. So, I have seen the Kerry Von Erich, Greg Valentine tape circulate around. That was a good match. Nothing wrong with so, Kerry Von Erich won. So was this one of the rare times that there was a TV crew there? The only time I can remember. The only time. Okay. okay. Yeah, the only time. It had a lighting problem. We had to leave the lights on in the house during the first fall. They were afraid the lighting would be screwed up. And uh, it turned out they could turn the lights out and it was all right. But we left the lights on in the house during the first fall, and that crowd was so intense. Uh, the policeman and the head of the security, I remember him coming down to ringside and saying, Larry, we've got to get the lights out. I don't know if we can control this crowd. They were so passionate about that match with Brody and Flair. It, it, it was an amazing crowd, and there were some policemen there from Belleville, and uh, where I live, and they were sitting in the fourth row ringside. I remember the one cop who was a detective telling me afterwards, he's man, I had my gun. He says, I had my hand on my gun the whole time. I was thinking, this, if Brody loses this thing, this crowd's going nuts. There was so much intensity, but no, it, it worked out fine. So, Larry, you're there. There's, you know, it's still a good crowd, 17,000 people. They got the TV crew in from Japan. What's going through your head that night? I mean, I would be thinking if I was in your position, like, Corn. this is going to be tough to compete with this, even as screwed up as they are. Well, I got Brody, so I knew I'd be all right. But uh, at least I thought I would. Well, well, and, what do you, but what are you thinking? I'm going to really be able to overtake these guys, or this is, gonna, this is dicey? A long, hard war. And maybe... In my head, something that would crystallize later, and we'll talk about in the next segment we talk about later in 83, that in the end it would somehow lead to a reconciliation where I would have the authority to go along with the responsibility and somehow peace would somehow be restored. That was probably pretty naive. Yeah, I was 36 years – well, I was going to turn 36. I was 35 years old at the time. I probably, no, I was 36, my mistake, I'm 36. And uh, I probably thought, 
that it was going to somehow all work out in the end because I would do well enough, and we ended up putting we would put we would put uh, Humpty Dumpty back together again. Like when the AFL and the NFL battled in the sixties, and, and then and you know you have to join because both are are equally strong. And that that was the hope, and something that we can talk about in more detail later. That came came up in a meeting I had with Fritz Meinerich in April of eighty three. And, and it's a long story, so we won't tell it now. We'll, okay. we'll do a cliffhanger on that one. But that came up in a meeting with Fritz. Okay, well, so the day— It was a sad night and a happy night. I mean, it, you know, we tried, I think, our best, all of us, to get along, but our background was so totally different. And without Sam there as that balancing point, it just didn't fit. It's as much my fault as their fault, and it just— wasn't going to work. Okay. And the NWA was a shadow of what it had been, and you could see that happening, and no, we didn't know anything about Vince McMahon at that time. Okay, the day after the Checkerdome show, it says here that you notif- and you've already said you've notified them. Did you say face-to-face? Did you do a letter? Did you? Leave I did a-, a letter at first, and then I talked to him face-to-face. And I did the next show, and I wrote a column saying that I was leaving. And I'll quote from that column just a little bit. I mentioned I thank different people. And I wrote in there, change is inevitable. New owners have different ways of doing things. Opportunities can slip away. This is not to criticize nor to judge right or wrong. This is simply to say that I do not feel I am as effective as I can be under the circumstances that exist. Perhaps it is time to move on and consider other options that are now open. And there was some thought in my mind, too, that I might might well want to get involved, you know, do a public relations company or something like that, but... That was uh, that was all smoke and mirrors. Oh, okay, in my own head. so Geigel, my Geigel opens this letter and he probably his jaw drops and his eyeballs are popping. Out. How what does he do, Larry? We got to talk. We got to talk. Oh yeah, yeah. And and we met off and on through that. Well, not as much as you would think. You would think they'd be in panic about it, but they weren't. And they probably thought it was one of the times I was glad that I'd re- I'd quit many times before, as you know, earlier in 1982. So they probably thought it was going to be like that. And I remember on the February 25th show. When I was there, which was actually the last show I worked for them at Keel Auditorium, this drew about 3,500 people. Uh, Kerry Von Erich against Cowboy Bob Orton for the Missouri title, and Andre the Giant in a 13 man battle royal. I remember Bob getting me aside that night and saying, What can we do to make you stay? And I really didn't have an answer because we talked about all these issues oh, so often, repeatedly, over the last 14 months. And I said, this is, this is the same things that we've always had, Bob. I, I, don't, I, can't, have author, I can't have responsibility without authority. I, I don't like the way the booking is going. I can't really give you that great answer. It's just not working. And it's time to move on. What, was it, had you already finalized the deal with Charlie? Would it, was it impossible to stay with them? Uh, we were probably on the verge of that. And I would say Charlie and I actually pinned it down the first part of March. Okay, why is the February 25th show, which is the last show you're – only 3,500 people. What's, what's, what's going on? Well, you're following a big show. The undercard didn't do much. Obviously, Orton wasn't over yet. Orton didn't care. It was a little bit of a quick turnaround match. And on the TV, February 13th, I announced I was done. So that I was leaving, and I said the same reasons why. And there, they didn't care. Larry was gone necessarily. But I think I was a symbol that things were different, and it hurt. Uh, I did keep track of their attendance after I left for a while. And just for what it's worth, let me turn this over. Not because it's me, but because they had to make changes. And, hey, they tried. They tried to keep it alive. Uh, March 11th, they drew 3,300 people for a match between Brody and Crusher Blackwell and a match between Race and Rick Martell. They were the two main events. On March 25th of 83, they drew 6,000 for Ric Flair against Kerry Von Eric. Ric Flair retaining the title. On April 15th, 1983, Crusher Blackwell winning the Missouri title from Kerry Von Erich. They drew 2,972. Whoa, whoa. What month was that? April 15th of 1983. And who's in the main event? Crusher Blackwell and Kerry Von Erich. 2,000? Oh, man. Ouch. Well, hang on a second. Okay. April 29th, 1983. Ric Flair kept the NWA title by beating Crusher Blackwell. Attendance 4,355. And the last one that I kept track of because I was on my own, I thought this is this is an... This is an exercise in self-torture. On May the 13th, 1983, Harley Race won the Missouri title by beating Crusher Blackwell, 1,590. Oh, my God. Oh. Now, and St. Louis had been so strong, and it just took Geigel like a year and a half to just run it right into the ground. 
I don't know if that's fair. I mean, there's blame. There's plenty of blame to pass around everywhere. I'll take my share of it too. But things had to change, and you would hope that that would shake, make them realize that something was missing, that they were doing something wrong. Because they were adding some people actually on the shows underneath at that time, but uh, still, it, you think it didn't my, happen. Larry, I, you I think my adding. think my running <laughs> into the ground a little too strong there, huh? Well, I'm trying to be diplomatic, I guess, and say things. You know, at the time, I would have agreed with you. Now, 27, 28 years later, you look back at it, and in retrospect, and you try to say, uh, let's have a little balance on it as we look at it, and let's not make everybody a bad guy or a good guy. We just didn't get along. We had different ways to run it, and once Sam was gone, Sam was the guy who held things together. Want to see how it happened elsewise? It wasn't just St. Louis. Let's take a look at the NWA. What was happening there, it took a little bit longer time to happen, but it did happen. And Vince was hearing it all. Yeah, but 83, some of the promotions were doing good business. Uh, Texas, oh, most business. St. Louis was the only one that was hurting. I think most of the business in the country were doing big business. Vern was doing great with the AW. Hey, wait yeah. a minute. While you're leaving, is Vern contacting you at all, or is he out of this? At this point, Vern is – I'm not hearing from Vern. Vern. Vern's just sitting back, and I still believe that, sitting back. Let the chips fall. I don't have it. There's nothing I can say. If I did talk to him, it's probably along the lines of, Larry, we don't want you to leave. Come on, let's try to work something out. The one call I did get in this time, and I think it was in March of that year, it was actually from Ric Flair. Uh, I'm sure he doesn't remember it, but it was in March of that year. And he called me here at the house, and I was done. I wasn't at the office or anything. I did keep doing it. I actually did enough TV for him, so they had me on TV through March because the tapes were that far ahead of time. So they had time to change, to get a different TV announcer. They brought in a man from Kansas City, I believe it was Kevin Wall, who was, you know, nothing wrong with him as an announcer, but, you know, he was from Kansas City. He clearly didn't know any of the background or anything. He was in a very tough spot. So, uh, But I remember Flair calling, and we talked for a long time. What can I do to put you back together? You understand how St. Louis works. It's been a great town for me. What can we do? What can we do? I said, Rick, I don't know what we can do. I mean, I've, I've brought up all these issues, and I tell him the issues, and, and I think people have seen. I mean, Rick's been involved in a lot of his own politics over the years, so I'm sure he had many of these same issues with people when he was coming and going, as the case may have been, with either WCW or WWF, WWE. Wow. Okay, Larry, I got more. It was a tough year. I got a lot more questions, but we're your voice. Well, we'll is, go, your we'll, voice is starting to go. So hey, we'll go into. 1983, the war, and uh, we'll talk about now, it. And then I, we'll go back to that nice fantasy stuff, talking about nostalgic stuff from 1961. Now, you're going to need to send me the results again because I have like 10 million emails here. I we're, will do we're, that for you. We're not going to go over any more St. Louis stuff, really. You didn't even see the shows, right? Nope. I stayed away for obvious reasons. But I, may, I might throw out a couple of things that uh, this we did at the very end. Uh, I, I added this up. Figuring the wrestling at the Chase era went from 1959 to February of 83. Ric Flair had 11 title defenses that averaged 13,086 people. Buddy Rogers had eight title defenses that averaged 11,076. Luthez, in the last title reign, had 16 defenses that averaged 10,000 people, 10,737. Dory Funk Jr. had 24 title defenses that averaged 10,703. And then Gene Kaniski, Pat O'Connor, Harley Race all followed behind them with averages in the high 9,000s. When you look at the people that drew money over that period, the two that I think stand out and deserve special mention are Gene Kaniski and Dick the Bruiser. Because Dick never had the world title. And in 19, I added up how many he'd drawn just as challengers. In 19 years, he had 18 challenges for the title, drew a total of 198,000 fans, he averaged 11,055 people every time he battled for the championship over 19 years. Folks, that ain't bad. Kaniski, over 22 years, was drawing that kind of money. Not counting his rate as champion, he had 12 other challenges, and in that he drew 10,223 people as the challenger, along with drawing over 10,000 people when he was the champion. So Did while that- it's hard to remember them, they could put some butts in seats, and they did it because they were great performers. I, I want to ask you about two other names. Did Dick the Bruiser talk to you at all during this time? No, but we did talk after when I started running uh, on my own. Okay. Amazingly, he called me for some of my talent to work TV, which probably doesn't say how strong his talent was, does it? That's probably a bad yeah. sign. I, and how about Lou Thez? <laughs> oh, Thez was a referee on my first show. Okay, so we'll get Lou into and I were the, talking on a regular basis. So you got it. you're going to send me the results from all – do you have all, all your shows? Yes. 
Although, again, the results, because if it wasn't that long of a thing, it's, again, what was going on behind the scenes and how it was going on that perhaps is as much of the story as what was actually happening what, in the ring. What was the total? No, we'll save. Okay, Larry, that's it. That's an, uh, You wore out, Gary? Well, I got a lot of questions. To me, it's fascinating. I really think this is... Well, uh, I hope everybody else thinks it's fascinating. It's ancient history to most of them. They're saying, oh, my God, this stuff was so old. Does anybody no, no, this? no. People are... I don't know. This is like the end of the glory days of wrestling, and the new era comes in. And It was. It I mean, was. the new era has been successful in a lot of ways, but in a lot of ways, I think if fans today could see what was available back then, they would, wouldn't want to watch what's available now. Well, I tend to be prejudiced. I, I think... Both could borrow something from the other. Thank you, Larry. Thanks, Gary. We'll talk again soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.